and how you can get involved. Uh, today will be kind of one that's just kind of filled with graphics and things to explain how it works. Next week, there's some Yahoo that's going to talk um, in the video. That's me. Um, and uh, then in the third Sunday, you'll hear from the founder of Love, Inc., um, and the reason he began the movement. And then the last one, you'll hear from Pam Burris, who is our executive director. And uh, her father is a member of the Weezer Church of Christ. So anyway, um, we're going to play this first video here. And uh, just keep in mind, if you have any questions, to talk to me afterwards. Thank you. non-denominational ministry on a mission to mobilize local churches to transform lives and communities in the name of Christ. Simply put, we help churches help people. Why? Because we believe there's nothing more powerful than churches working together as the body of Christ. As the body of Christ, every Christian church, regardless of denomination, is called to serve their neighbors and share their resources. They are called to walk with people who are struggling within their walls and out in their community. So where do we come in? Love Inc. connects the calling of local churches to the struggles of the community. Here's how Love Inc. works. A community member with a need calls a local church. This could be a simple request like diapers for their child or food for their family or something bigger like a bed for their daughter or some other type of support. And they ask, can you help me? The church can say, yes, we partner with other churches so that we can. Call Love Inc. to learn more. So they call and we pick up. We listen to them. We get to know them, their strengths and struggles, their hopes and dreams. We want to know about more than their current crisis because we're not just about meeting needs. We're about meeting people where they're at and caring for them holistically. Then, through Love, Inc.'s network of churches and community relationships, we work to help. Diapers are provided by one church, groceries by another, while classes and mentoring are provided by others. And it's all coordinated by Love, Inc. So at every step, our neighbors are met with dignity and respect, while our partner churches are free to focus on serving according to their strengths, knowing that each individual will be fully cared for by the body of Christ within their community. The result? Transformed lives, transformed churches, and transformed communities. So everything that's donated to Love, Inc. of Washington County stays within Washington County and helps people throughout our county. Uh, as you saw there, the model is that different churches provide different things to help. Uh, so like this congregation, we have a food pantry back here. And if there's a request, somebody needs some help with some groceries, we're able to provide that. The Weezer Church of Christ that I also work with, um, we have a, a hygiene pantry there. So people can come in and ask for help uh, with that. And we can provide things like toothpaste and toothbrushes and toilet paper and those kinds of things. Um, and so somebody might come and say there's a, a young woman who has fled a domestic um, dispute situation and she's left and she has three kids and she needs help. Uh, it could be a difficult thing for one church to meet all of her needs. But if she goes to Love, Inc., then we will get a call and say, we have this situation. Um, could you help her with some groceries and some hygiene items? And then we do that. And then another congregation might provide diapers and things like that. And together we can really help a person. So uh, that's kind of the model behind it. And uh, love to talk with you more about it if you have questions. Okay, thanks. All right, let's move on to our next song. It
So there's a, a, a lot of different uh, ways of looking at what we uh, come to every week to do this. Um, what I'm going to be looking at is, is John chapter 18, verse 10, uh, for those of you that would like to go there. Um, it says, then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malichus. Um, there's a lot of different ad adaptations uh, to this story as far as like visually looking. Um, one of the ones that I saw was uh, when this happened, uh, Jesus, the next verse is that Jesus commanded uh, Peter to put away his sword. Um, and it and he says, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Well, after that, in the visual perception of this, Jesus, after Peter put away his sword, he healed the servant. So basically reattached the ear, made it look like it was not there. Because um, back, back in that time, if you did something like that, they would arrest you and, and you'd be crucified and put to death. And so... What Jesus basically did here is he saved Simon Peter or Peter. He took away that sin. And obviously, you know, the rest of the story is that he was arrested and he was taken in. So uh, this is just a, uh, another way of looking at what Jesus has done for us. He's taken our sin onto himself and he's washed us clean so that we do not have to account for that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and remember that. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come together today and uh, partake of the, the bread that signifies your body, let's just uh, remember to do it in a way that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear Lord, as we partake of the fruit of the vine, uh, let's just remember uh, the sacrifice that you made by shedding your blood to wash away our sins and give us the salvation of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.
uh, chapter 3, verse 17, that whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so that's where the song comes from. So it's, it's about action and serving. Well... Let us pray for the offering. Dear Lord, as we uh, pass around the offering today, let's just uh, do it in, in a way that's pleasing to you and be able to, to utilize what we bring in to glorify your name and, and, and show the world and locally uh, what you can do for them. In Jesus' name, amen. should have made earlier, I forgot about. Um, on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock, we have our youth group gathering. So this is kids basically ages 12 through 18. And Ryan and I often flip-flop back and forth leading that. And Trent also fills in from time to time. On uh, Wednesday the 21st, all three of us cannot do that night. And so I'm wondering if there's any brave souls out there that love teenagers that might want to lead youth group that night. And it can be anything that you would like to do. Um, kids are particularly fond of snacks and that kind of thing. So, you know, if you bring them donuts, they won't care what you do. Um, but we spend some time reading the word together, praying, play ping pong, play various games, things like that. Uh, but we spend time together in the word and in prayer. And so... Wednesday the 21st, I'd love somebody to say, hey, I'll take that night. So um, 
if, if that's you, then talk to me after worship today. Um, today, I believe Caroline is going to be back there in the nursery. Thank you. She's nodding and ready for the assignment. So thank you, Caroline. Uh, today, we're continuing in our series on uh, what Christians do. And I'm going to have you go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20 is where we'll go to eventually here. Let's pray together as we come to the word today. Father, I'm thankful for an opportunity to open your word. I'm thankful, Father, for an opportunity for us to be reminded about who you are, to be reminded of our great need for you. Father, to be reminded that you show us how to live, especially through your son, Jesus, who um, gave up everything. He, he did not count equality with you a thing to be grasped or exploited, but he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant and even went to death, death on a cross for our sake. And so today, Father, as we look to your word and we're reminded how you serve through your son, Jesus, that you also uh, expect us to serve in his example. So, Father, bless our time together today in the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, at one time, if you were to communicate with somebody, the fastest that communication could be passed would be just as fast as a person could carry it, right? We are used to communication being almost instant, and it can happen around the world. I mean, it's so funny to me, especially when I communicate with younger people, young adults, teenagers, if I get a text message and they ask me a question, and if I don't respond within 15 minutes or so, then they'll send another one like, are you there? And if I don't respond because I've chucked my phone for some peace, and then they're like, oh, I'm sorry to bother you. I hope I haven't offended you. But I'm like, by the time I get there, there's five messages like that. I'm like, I'm sorry, I just didn't have my phone. It's okay, you know? But we kind of expect uh, communication to happen so fast, as fast as I can type it and hit send or through an email or whatever, you know, communication can be really fast in our day and age, but at one time, it was not so. The fastest mode of communication went through something we know as the Pony Express. You guys remember? Well, probably you don't remember from personally being there, <laughs> hopefully anyway. Um, but perhaps you remember hearing about it. It was an organized relay of horseback riders and the route went from Sacramento, California to Joseph, Missouri. It was a route of about 2,000 miles, and it took 10, mi uh, sorry, 10 days for information to go that far. It cost about $2.50 per ounce that you were sending. And in fact, uh, President Lincoln's inaugural address was passed that way west as it was carried along on the Pony Express. It operated from 1860 to 1861, about 17 months. And then by those 17 months, uh, the telegraph came in and it made the Pony Express obsolete. So that's all it lasted for, which is probably a good thing, as you'll find out here in a moment. Riders had to do about 75 to 100 miles a day by horse. Now, 100 miles, you know, was basically from Midville to Boise. And it's no big deal for me to get in my truck and drive to Boise. You know, at certain points, I'm at 80 miles per hour. That's on the freeway, by the way, uh, when I get out there, you know. And so I can make that trip in like an hour and a half. No big deal. I'll be comfortable the whole time. But for people in the Pony Express to do that, I was pretty rough. And they would ride about 15 to 20 miles, and then they would hop on the next fresh horse waiting there for them to keep on riding as fast as they could. They carried very few things. Obviously, they're carrying the mail that needs to be transported. But they got a few provisions, like they would carry flour and cornmeal, bacon, of course. Uh, they would get a medical pack, which had turpentine and borax and cream of tartar. I don't even know what you use that for. Is it, isn't cream of tartar something for cooking? Okay, yeah. Um, 
They faced terrible weather. Obviously, riding a horse that long is not very fun either. Possible Indian attacks on the way. I mean, this was scary business, right? There was an advertisement trying to get riders to come and to do this job. The advertisement read like this. Wanted, young, skinny, wiry fellows. Not Sorry, Ryan. Not over 18. Must be expert riders willing to risk daily. Okay. Um, Austin, you fit in there? Under 18. You look wiry. Okay. Are you an expert horseback rider? I don't think so. Don't think so? Okay. <laughs> so close. Oh, here's one more thing that was added to the wanted poster. Orphans preferred. <laughs> Why? No family to mourn them if something happens to them on the way. Okay, that was pretty scary business. But they never had a shortage of riders. Isn't that kind of an amazing thing? They never had a shortage of riders. Why? Well, because people often want to belong to something that they think is really important and worthwhile. Maybe even if it's dangerous, they'll, they'll face the danger if it's important enough, right? And if you're under 18 and a guy, you're invulnerable, you're immortal anyway, and you're ready to take on the world, so that sounds like fun. And then the camaraderie and the sense of adventure that these young guys would have you know, probably drew them to do this, to be a part of the Pony Express, except I wonder how many of those guys dropped out after reality set in, after all of a sudden it wasn't fun and exciting, and well, the exciting part was like scary because I almost lost my life. I've got the arrow in my hat to prove it, you know? Maybe one of those, how many of those guys dropped out? And I wonder, could we think of the Christian life in a similar way? Maybe when somebody becomes a Christian, they're excited about it. It's a new adventure to follow Jesus. They want to do big things, important things for the kingdom of God. You know, maybe they sign up and think, you know, I want to carry the gospel and I'm willing to go to South America or Africa or where I'm going to do something, something big for the Lord. But then after a while, it's not exciting and it's not an adventure and it gets hard and I lose friends or I lose my reputation because I am a Christian and then maybe we want to drop out. Well, the simple reality of being a Christian is that we're called to serve our neighbors. Not very exciting <laughs> to serve our neighbors. Sometimes it's so boring or difficult that we want to give up. And I was thinking about this quote by Bernard of Clairvaux. He said, learn the lesson that if you want to do the work of a prophet, what you need is not a scepter, but a hoe. <laughs> In other words, you need to be ready to do the hard work. Even Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, he exchanged a crown for a basin and a towel, didn't he? So, in our series so far, in what Christians do, we have focused on following Jesus. We focused on reading the Word of God. We've focused on prayer and the importance of that. We focused last week on worship and the fact that we need to be doing that all the time. That's individually and privately, but also corporately with the body of Christ. And today we're adding to that list that Christians serve. If you are a Christian, it is assumed that you will serve other people. Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Why have you been redeemed by the blood of Christ? Is it so that you can get to heaven someday? That's kind of what we focus on sometimes. Well, that is our hope. And it's not a, I hope so, but in Christ we do have that hope, that surety. But here it tells us, you have been redeemed to serve the living God. That's why you have been saved. So, how do we serve him? Well, it makes me think about the question one of the experts in the law came to Jesus and said, what's the greatest command? And 
Jesus is a little tricky here, but he says to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. The law and the prophets are all summed up in these two. So he says here, the greatest command is to love God with all your being and to love your neighbor. Why does he do two? Well, they're connected together. Jesus, in essence here, is saying, in order for you to love God with all your being, you have to love your neighbor. If you're loving your neighbor, then you're loving God with all your being. The two are connected here together. Makes me think of Matthew 25 as well. In this parable that Jesus says in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, Jesus talks about when you have given the least of these food or a drink or you have clothed them, or you have visited them in prison, or you've encouraged them, you've done that to me. And if you haven't done those things, then you haven't done those things to me. Jesus connects himself to people. The way you treat them is the way you are treating Jesus. And so he says, you are called to serve me by serving other people. The two are connected. Now, that's not a natural way for us to think. I don't think of other people first. I think of myself first. And serving others means putting others above myself. It's just contrary to the way that we think. I'd like to have you turn to Matthew 20, verses 20 through 28. And I just realized I walked up here without my Bible. I might need that. Or maybe I've misplaced my Bible. Where's my Bible? I had it right here. This isn't supposed to be part of the sermon. There's not like some cool lesson I'm teaching right now. <laughs> Seriously, I had it right here. All right, let it go, she says. <laughs> it's kind of like a lumberjack showing up without an axe or a chainsaw. <laughs> All right, okay. Matthew 20, verses 20 through 28, kind of looks the same. All right, my goodness. Let's read this together here. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand, and one at your left in your kingdom. And Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said, We are able. He said to them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The word of God for us today. So... Ah, Mrs. Zebedee here comes up to Jesus and says, well, look at the way she approaches, first of all. She comes up with her sons, and they're probably like, oh, mom, mom. But they come up there, and she kneels before Jesus, right? So she comes in a worshipful stance, but Jesus knows enough to, oh, here it comes. She's going to ask for something. It's the same way my kids, when they come up and they say something nice to me, I know they're going to ask for something. And uh, he looks at her and he says, what do you want? And she says, say to these two sons of mine that they are to sit at your right hand and your left in your kingdom when it comes. I want these two sons to be junior messiahs right next to you when your kingdom comes. You know these guys, right? What they've left behind, they've come so far. Would you do this for them? And Jesus says, you do not know what you're asking. Can you drink the drink that I'm going to drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm going to be baptized with? And what he's talking about here probably is his suffering and death, right? 
Because it's in the garden, when Jesus leaves after the Passover meal with his disciples and they go out into the garden and he goes all the way from Peter, James, and John, these two guys here, James and John, and he says to God, as he's face down on the ground, you know, if there's any way that this cup could pass from me, that's what I want, but not my will, yours be done. So he talks about this cup that he doesn't want to drink. It's a cup of destruction, his own destruction. And so he says, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Can you go through the stuff that I'm going to? Are you going to suffer and die also? And they're like, yeah, we can do that. Kids, <laughs> they don't know what they're signing up for, right? Jesus goes on to say, look, my kingdom is not about what you think it's about. Mom, you've come here asking for my sons to be in these positions of authority and power in the kingdom of God when it comes, but that's not what the kingdom of God is about. He said, that's the way the Gentiles think. I mean, those that have some power and authority, they lord it over other people so they can feel big and important and make other people do the things that they want them to do. But that's not the way it is. He says, in the kingdom of God, the first and the most important is the least. If you want to be high in the kingdom of God, become a slave. He's like, after all, the Son of Man has come here not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He says, I'm going to die for the people. The Son of God is going to go and do this. If you back up just a little bit here, with that in mind, go back to Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Who is the greatest? Okay, this is kind of the same discussion that was going on here two chapters later. Right? Who's the greatest? Notice what the other disciples, how they reacted when Mrs. Zebedee says, Hey, Jesus, grant my sons to be at your right and left in the kingdom. And they find out about it. And the other guy's like, rah, rah, rah. Why are they moving for position here? You know, we've been here as long as those guys have almost. You know, we need to have that. And Jesus here hears them talking. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus says, Okay, I'll show you who's greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Let's see. How about Cody? Is Cody back there? Who's got Cody today? Cody gets passed around. Hey, Cody. Over here. Hi, Cody. Hey. So, yeah, thanks. She waved right back at me. So, you can imagine here if Brady and Emily and Cody are in the audience that Jesus is talking to, right? And they're... People are like, who's the greatest in the kingdom? Because that's what we want to be like. And Jesus says, hey, be like Cody. Really? Loud and crawling around? What do you, what do you mean, Jesus, being like this little one here? He says, the greatest in the kingdom is like this child here. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Think about children and work. Maybe not like how well they get the job done or how thoroughly they do the job, you know, but think about how willing little kids are to do a job. Not teenager kids, but little kids, okay? I think about these little ones here with my wife here today, even Evangeline just on Saturday morning. Uh, Saturday morning is dad's morning to get breakfast for the kids and stuff, you know? So Evangeline is lickety split, like, let me help with breakfast. Let me help with it. I can make scrambled eggs. I can do that, you know, taking away the one breakfast that dad can make. You know, she's willing to do that, and she's eager for it, you know. I can remember another time, Evangeline, when we were in the backyard here. You were little. It was a few years ago, and when we still had maple, our yellow lab. And um, it was after the snow had melted away, and all of maple's excrement was still in the yard, right? And so I'm out there starting to shovel this stuff up. Benjamin's like, can I help? I'm like, sure. Here's a shovel. And while we were doing it, Benjamin's like, 
this is fun, Dad. I'm like, you're shuffling dog poop. You think this is fun? She's eager to serve. Children are eager to serve. They just want to be with their father working, right? That's what Jesus says here. Humble yourself like this child. They just want to be near you. They just want to help, right? And following Jesus, we want to serve in the same way as children do their father. So what are the reasons somebody might want to serve? There's three different ways I could think about that somebody might want to serve. First of all, some people may want to serve to gain somebody's approval, right? So if I do all these good things for this person, then maybe they'll like me and they'll approve of me and I'll get something out of this. And so that can last as long as the person is glad with the job that you're doing or maybe they get tired of you, or maybe you mess up on it a little bit and they don't like it and then they're done with you. And so you don't get their approval anymore. So maybe you want to serve because you're going to get approval by somebody and that just doesn't last. Or the second way is maybe you want to serve other people to gain God's approval. So let me ask you, how much do you need to do to really gain the approval of God? How much do you need to do? How much serving do you need to do that's worthy of the exchange of God giving his only son, his only perfect sinless son for you? What would be enough serving that that could be a worthy exchange? You can't. There's no way that you can do enough to gain God's approval. You won't do enough. You won't do it well. It just doesn't work that way. Nothing could be exchanged for the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. So you can't serve other people in order to gain God's approval. But here's the way that the scriptures tell us uh, we should be serving. That we should serve others out of gratitude for what God has already done for us. Right? God has given his son Jesus to die for you to take your place. Therefore, I... I'm thankful and I want to serve out of gratitude. That motivates me and that helps me to do the work. And I'll be thankful and I'll be excited about the work because I know I'm just saying thanks. I don't have to earn this, right? That's how service should be done. I think about Isaiah chapter 6 and I read this last passage as a place to think about what true worship is like, where Isaiah sees God in the temple and his, the train of his robe just filled the temple up, right? And there's smoke and there's seraphim that are, they're just flying around and they're just saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And they're just worshiping him. And Isaiah falls on his face and he says, I'm undone. I'm unworthy to be in your presence. I come from a people of unclean lips. I have unclean lips. And then one of the seraphim came with a hot coal from the altar, which is symbolic of forgiveness and atonement, and touches it to Isaiah's lips, and it says, your sins are atoned for. And then when God says, who shall we send? Who, who can go for us? And Isaiah says, here I am. Send me, right? That's the kind of motivation I'm talking about here of serving out of gratitude for what God has done here. Isaiah says, you've cleansed me, send me, I will go. Now you can think about various ways to serve here and I'd like to try to expand that list a little bit in your minds. Uh, if we are called to serve, if we're expected to serve, what does service look like? Well, the first thing that comes to mind are probably physical jobs, right? Um, hey, let me come over and I know that you, you know, you're in a cast because you slipped and fell. Let me mow your lawn, you know, or you're behind on your fencing. Let me get, John would love to have you out there helping with the fencing, you know. Uh, these are the kinds of things that we think about with physical jobs. And that's what comes to our mind first, probably in service. And that's a really good way to think about it here is doing physical jobs to help other people. But maybe that's not an easy thing for everybody. Maybe you get to a point in your life where you can't do those physical jobs anymore or you struggle with that. Does that mean you can't serve? No, there are a lot of other ways to think about service. First of all, I'd just like to remind you to think about service this way. Think about the service of small things. Small things 
is a great way to serve other people. For instance, in your own home, what if you just thought about, I'm just going to consider the next person here. There's only two people in the house. That's your spouse or whatever. I'm just going to consider the next person here. Yeah, I just emptied the toilet paper roll and I'll put on the next one. That's a, that's a small service, but the next person will be happy that you put it there. What about you drink the last of the milk and you know that there's more milk out in the refrigerator or out in the garage? Well, you go out there and you get it and bring it in there so that the next person that comes has a full, um, a full jug of milk waiting there for them. Small things, right? I'll wash some dishes here so the next person has some clean dishes and doesn't have to wash. These are small things that you can do in your own home, just considering the next person. And small things can add up and add up to big things. And after a years of doing small things for somebody in your life, all of a sudden, you've been serving them for a long time. Think about this. I'd like to offer the service of guarding the reputation of others. What if you just made it your goal here? I'm not going to say anything to cut somebody down, even if they deserve it, even if I got lots of ammunition on them. I'm not going to say something to cut them down. I'm not going to say something to make them look bad. I'm just going to, that's my goal. Or when somebody else is talking bad about somebody, I'm going to stop it right there and say, you know, let's not talk about them like that, okay? You can guard their reputation by guarding your own mouth and also by stopping it when other people start talking about it, okay? Stopping the gossip right there. You're guarding the reputation of this person, okay? That's, that's a service that you can do very easily. Guard the reputation of others. The fourth one, the service of being served. Now, this is going to seem kind of weird, but do any of you have a hard time accepting service or gifts from other people? What gets in the way? Oh, man, I don't deserve it. I don't need it. I don't want to require that of them. You know, I got this, I'm on my own. Most of the time, our pride gets in the way of that. But service is not about us. It's not about our own pride. It's about humbling ourselves for other people. And so if you submit to that and you lower yourself and allow somebody to serve you, you're blessing them. By the way, if somebody comes to you and says, I'd love to help you with this thing, who are you to say, I know that you know, God encouraged you to come speak to me today and offer that to you, but I don't want to accept your help. God sent that person to you. You're turning down the one that God sent to you. I would suggest not to do that, but to accept it instead. So one way you can serve is by being served. Accept that from other people. It blesses them, and it blesses the Lord. This one might be a little controversial. The service of common courtesy, and you're going to go, courtesy is not common anymore. That's true. <laughs> but think about common courtesy in this way. Not that it's common to everyone, but instead that I should show courtesy to everyone. No matter who they are, I'm going to show courtesy to them, to common people. High, low, whatever I think of them doesn't matter here. I'm ready to be courteous to them. You know, words like thank you and yes, please, and you're welcome and hold the door open for somebody and see if they need help. Titus 3.2 says, we are to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. This is one of the ways people will look at you and say, this person is different from the rest of culture around me here. Maybe that person is a Christian. So the service of common courtesy. How about the service of hospitality? 1 Peter 4.9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Invite some people to your home to enjoy a meal together. We got to do that recently, and it was a really sweet time with really good food. And the conversation was wonderful, too. Maybe think about somebody is having a difficult time and they need a place to stay. You could offer a bed to them. I'm, I'm mindful of when I was in Salt Lake City... I was involved with our youth group in um, ministry at the Salt Lake Rescue Mission and um, 
you know, in Salt Lake at that time, the homeless population was well over 5,000. It's probably more than that now. But um, I got to know a couple of guys and their girlfriends, uh, LeVar and Robert and Carrie and Christina. And those guys somehow made it to church on one particular Sunday, and Robert and LeVar were baptized that day. And I was so excited about it. And Randy, our preaching minister, um, was lifting them up and praising God for it. And then we were ready to conclude and we were starting to close the service in prayer. And so what do you do? You start thinking about lunch. And I thought, oh man, these guys were just baptized into Jesus. I hope somebody invites them for lunch. And I'm thinking, I should probably invite them for lunch. But I don't know, that might feel awkward for Elise. We have these little ones at home. Should we invite them into our home? I don't know. And I turn to her, open my mouth, and she goes, we should have them over for lunch today. I'm like, thank you, Lord, yes. <laughs> so we invited Robert and Carrie and LeVar and Christina over for lunch. And it was simple fare. It was Cheetos and hot dogs, right? I mean, and it was upgraded because we had barbecue sauce. <laughs> um, but as we ate, those guys talked with my older boys at that time were younger, talked about video games and basketball and stuff like that. And we ate this meal. Robert looks at me and he goes, with a full mouth of hot dog, this is the first time I've ever eaten at a table. I'm like, man, the guy's like 21 years old. Now, um, that's just a simple act of hospitality for us. It felt a little bit risky, but it really wasn't. These guys came and ate in our home, and uh, our relationship with them went on for a period of years. I've lost track of them since then. But showing hospitality can be something as simple as inviting somebody over and having a meal. How about the service of listening to people? This is also something uncommon in our society today actually listening to each other. What do you talk about when you talk with other people? Do you talk about yourself? Do you listen to other people as they're talking to you? Stop talking about yourself. <laughs> One thing we can do to show other people that they're important to serve them is to not talk about me, but to ask questions about them, care about them, prefer them in that moment. It's a simple thing here. And by the way, I think that we'll do much better as a society if we listen to one another instead of just yelling what I think and that you're wrong. Um, the service of listening. And you know also that sometimes God wants to speak to you through other people. It's happened to me a bunch of times. And if I'm going to be talking about myself and not listening, I'm not going to be listening to the Lord who wants to speak to me either. So the service of listening. And then the last thing I want to share here is the service of Bearing the burdens of other people. Galatians 6 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. How do you obey the law? How do you obey the word of God? One of the ways is helping bear somebody else's burdens. When they're struggling with their health, come alongside them. When they're struggling with their work, come alongside them. Their truck is broken down, come alongside them. You know, there's various ways that you can do it. Just let them talk, listen to them, and bear the burden with them. Sit with those who mourn. Visit others in hospital. Write to others in prison. Make a meal for somebody who's struggling. These are ways that you can bear the burdens of other people at difficult times. So these are some ways that you can serve. And really, only one of them just requires that you are physically able to do this. A lot of these are just about listening or talking. It's pretty simple stuff here. I'd like to offer some, some ways now for you to think about some motivations for you to serve. Because you can hear from me, oh, he gave us a list of some good things to do. I should do those things. But then as soon as you leave and you're thinking about lunch and then something happens and some kid is sick, and then your battery in your car is dead, and before you know it, you've forgotten the whole thing, and then you're not thinking about serving anymore. Let's look at some ways that we should be motivated to serve. Uh, the first one here is that we can be motivated by obedience. 
Deuteronomy 13, 4 says, You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And you shall serve him and hold fast to him. So one of the things that can motivate us to serve is just obeying the Lord. You don't feel like serving? That's okay. You can still obey him. Right? You don't have to feel like doing it. Just obey. That's what Christians do. You can also be motivated by gratitude, which is my favorite way to be motivated. Somebody else has done something kind for me. The Lord has done something for me. I can just say thanks by serving back. 1 Samuel 12 verse 24 says, Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. I love that. Serve the Lord. Serve him faithfully. Fear him. Why? Think about the good things that he's done for you. Let that motivate you. Be motivated by gladness. Psalm 100 verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Let joy and gladness be a motivation for you to serve. Be motivated by forgiveness and not guilt. Any of you guys good motivators with guilt out there that you can use against your kids or use against your spouse or whatever? I mean, that might get something done, but inside that person's like, I'm not happy about doing it here. Instead, we're supposed to be motivated by forgiveness, not guilt. Think about that passage from Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah was forgiven. He's been atoned for. His sins were cleansed. And he said, here am I, send me. Being motivated by forgiveness. Be motivated by love. Galatians 5.13 says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Be motivated by love. We are very free people. And we are free not to just use it for ourselves, but to serve other people and to do it motivated by the love of God. And then, last, I'd like to say that we should be motivated by humility. John 13, verses 12 through 16, I think about Jesus in that upper room when he shared the Passover meal with his disciples. And symbolically, he exchanged his crown for a basin and a towel to wash the feet of his disciples. He said, do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. But if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. So our Lord and Savior, our Master, was willing to get down and to wash the feet of his disciples. He was willing to serve. We're not greater than him. Therefore, we should do the same thing. I think about Larry saying that one time in his business that every once in a while, he would just be in the rotation to clean the bathrooms too. He owned the business, but it didn't mean he was above washing toilets. And that's the way it is, thinking about our Master, Jesus. He serves humbly. We're called to do the same thing. So I need to tell you that serving is not pretty, but it is good. Last story I'd like to share is I, I think about the many, many years I spent up at Camp Ivydale, uh, a Christian camp up near Idaho City. And I've served there as a counselor, as um, an assistant director, as a director. I've helped in a lot of different ways. I've been a teacher there um, over 25 years or so. I did things, but... Um, it was the small things that uh, nobody knew about <laughs> that were the hardest because I didn't get recognition for it. And I'm thinking about one time when my friend Howard Jones and I were both uh, given the task of power washing the girls' and boys' bathrooms. And so the flooring in these bathrooms, they're cinder block bathrooms, and the flooring are just these... Um, what are the things that you can get at the dump that are free? We have our shoes hanging on. Pallets, yeah. Wooden pallets. That's the floor in the bathrooms, right? And so for years and years, kids would come in there back and forth, tracking back and forth and stuff. And so we lifted up those pallets and power washed the floor out. And power washing in a small space. I mean, when we were done, we looked like walking biohazards. It was just all over us. It was so gross. It was so gross, we were laughing at each other how gross we were. 
Serving is not pretty, but it's good. And the next time I came back to camp and those kids were using the bathroom and didn't care a hoot about who washed it, I'm like, I cleaned that up for them. <laughs> Can I give you a challenge? Will you make a goal to serve someone this week? Maybe it's not in your normal rotation of things. It's out of the normal things that you do. Make a goal to serve someone this week. Will you pray that God will show you someone to serve this week? I'm mindful of a preacher down in Austin, Texas, who gave a sermon one time on this topic of service. And he had up at the back door of their church uh, a couple of phrases. He said, you've all been in here today to worship. Today, as you leave, I want you to be leaving, exiting this place ready to serve. And so on above the door frame, as people were leaving, it said, enter to worship, exit to leave. <laughs> I did it. Exit to serve, right? Okay. And so today, as you're leaving, I want you to be looking up there. And that's what it says. Enter to worship, exit to serve. As you're leaving today, be ready to serve other people because that's what the Lord Jesus has done for us. Let's stand and sing our invitation song. Take my Father, we just want to thank you so much for your word through Kevin today, Lord. As we celebrate this month of February of love and Valentine's Day, may we use this month also to share our love with others by serving them through this small action. It will show not only our love for others, but our love for you, Lord. We pray for safe travels home and a good potluck this afternoon of fellowship and meeting others and learning more about them and listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.